Next to the stage will be Mauricio L. Miller, uh, a Mexican-American social entrepreneur, public speaker, and author based in Oakland, California. He's the founder of the nonprofit organization Family Independence Initiative, but above all, he is a believer in the firsthand experience, wisdom, and leadership of the poor. Mauricio was born in a border town in Mexico and later moved to San Jose with his mom and sister. His mother sacrificed everything to send Mauricio to college, where he, where he came to recognize that there was a very different world for those he went to school with. It was in school and afterward that Miller would focus his efforts on growing an economy from the bottom up. When I asked him why he's still at it backstage just now, he said, I really think we might have a shot at changing this crazy top-down system. Mauricio is here to share a vision of a world in which three-fourths of our global population who live in poverty are recognized as the contributors they already are, and a future in which their vision and their own liberation acts as a guiding light towards change. Please welcome to the stage Mauricio Miller. Thank you, Thank you much. Hi, good morning. I'm really happy to be here and uh, half awake. But um, so my name is kind of confusing. As you mentioned, I was actually uh, from Mexico, and Miller is my mother's name. Um, my father's last name was Lim, and it just got thrown in there. But um, my mother divorced my father when I was two years old by basically having him jailed for attempted murder. And then I was raised by her. Uh, so it was my sister and I. And we came up to San Jose, California. Everything was sacrificed so that one kid could go to college. Ended up going to UC Berkeley and um, entered a very different world. So for my mother, the, the difficulty was that she was seen in a very stereotypical way. She was a Mexican mother, single mom, third grade education. Um, people thought she wasn't very smart. She didn't make good decisions. Um, at this point, they think she was a criminal or a rapist. But how she should have been seen is that she was actually a really talented designer, wonderful seamstress, very hardworking, and that somehow or other, there was no system in the United States that actually recognized that side of her. And that's what was really upsetting to her. She was not here to get charity or to have direction from somebody else as to how to raise her kids, certainly not from my father. So, uh, somehow or other, she was very disappointed with the United States, and things did not go well, and so everything concentrated on me. So the dilemma was that she fell into the stereotype that exists here and worldwide, which is that people are stuck in poverty, that there's something wrong with them, that they don't know how to make good decisions, or they're lazy, uh, or they're potential criminals. And this issue of being stuck in poverty is so untrue. Even the Census Bureau comes up that only in the United States, only about 3% stay in poverty for more than three years. And that is hugely different than the 15% that you hear about being stuck in poverty. So that means people are doing something. And if they're doing something, we don't seem to have a system that recognizes what they do. What we do is we have a system that tries to recognize what they don't do and what they can't do or what they're weak at or what the needs are. And then we invest, and we invest in ways that make sense for us to then be the helper. And so for her, that made no sense. You know, that really what she needed is a system that would look at her talents and so this is kind of the Census Bureau that has been doing these studies for ages. And then if you go to countries like Liberia that I just came back from, almost everybody is doing something. The economy there is totally devastated with a civil war, Ebola, and you don't see people laying down dying on the street. You actually see them working together, again, against the stereotypes. Before any of us existed and there were any programs or social impact investors, People formed entire towns, microeconomies, and so this was kind of the history that my mother actually came to this country for. And somehow or other, that wasn't happening. And in many ways, I think our sector contributes to keeping what people do really invisible, because all the focus is on what we do and what we can do. And there was one story that I read about uh, that I think it might have been in Greenwood in, in, uh, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, where there was a barber who, barber who started a barbershop 
and his cousin learned how to cut hair and started a barber shop in another town. And in the other town, his brother then was doing construction and started then a construction company that then started hiring other people. And this is how the black townships were really developed, is that person to person, people pooling their dollars. And it, what you ended up seeing is that in Oklahoma alone, after slavery, they built 50 townships and ultimately they built the black colleges and whatever. You know, um, a more contemporary example for me was that in the 90s and early 2000s, uh, if you would walk into a donut shop in California, you would see Cambodians running the donut shops. And Cambodians came to own 80 to 90% of the donut shops in California. And how did that happen? And so a reporter went back and he found this one person, Ted Noy, who had worked at Winchell's Donuts, learned how to run a donut shop, then started his own donut shop, worked with two cousins to start their own donut shops, and then those were the early adopters after, off of his talent. And then that idea of starting donut shops starts spreading throughout the Cambodian community. And this is really how things spread. And that's what is really important for us to learn because we keep thinking that somehow or other we replicate programs in our systems that work for us, it's gonna work. But actually humans are really different. That they tend to follow one another. And so the, the slide, which went off, I don't want to look, don't look at me. Um, anyway, so there's this whole issue called diffusion of innovation. Okay, so read about diffusion of innovation. It's basically tipping point. So if you want something to scale with humans, you need to understand diffusion of innovation, which means there has to be some positive deviant. There have to be early adopters that test it. This is how Facebook got tested at Harvard. And ultimately then you start getting the initial majority that actually starts scaling something. So humans actually scale things very, very differently. Um, one, of the, one of the stories in terms of um, Probably the best documented that I've heard of is, uh, how many of you have heard about the Save the Children uh, project in Vietnam around nutrition? Well, a few of you have. So what happened was that the Vietnamese government had realized that uh, nutrition was a huge problem in the villages, and so they asked Save the Children to come in, and sure enough, nutrition was huge for the children. You know? and what they had trouble figuring out is, okay, well, what could be indigenous solutions? Because you couldn't bring the solutions from the U.S. And they found that there were two or three families in the, the three or four villages that they were studying that actually their kids were doing fine. And they discovered that those families were positive deviants. They were doing something a little bit differently in terms of what they used for the food and how often they fed their children. So then they went back to the Viennese government and said, okay, we discovered a solution. Can we bring it in, have teachers, and all, you know, to, to big, a, a big program. And the Vietnamese government said, there's not enough money for that. So they went back to the villages, and they decided to do is actually get those three families that were doing it in a certain way and say, could you teach the rest of the villagers? And then when you teach those to the villagers, could some of them go to the next village and teach them? So all of the teaching actually was pass it forward. Okay, and in that, then within, I think it was seven years, I may have all this screwed up, but like nutrition of 50,000 children, actually once it actually start catching on, then all of a sudden other people actually found that, that they could actually change that. And so that was one of the best documented in terms of positive deviance. Oh, great, go back. Okay, so my biggest experience was really with Javier and Maria. So I started a project called the Family Independence Initiative, which was really to try to capture the data on a monthly basis of what families do for themselves and how they help each other. Jerry Brown helped me to start this prog program. It was uh, basically we gave every family a computer, uh, we had them work together, and they documented what they did. And uh, one of the family, one of the groups of families, because we on only enrolled uh, families in their in their groups with their friends. Um, Javier and Maria actually regularly said nothing at the meetings that we had to find out what they were doing. And one day my staff comes in and says, well, Javier and Maria ran into the Spanish-speaking real estate agent who promised them he could actually help them buy this house at the end of the block, and we think he's a predatory lender. Can we say anything? So my project with Jerry Brown was set up to not interfere. What we wanted was clean data as to what families were capable of doing for themselves and for each other. So I told my staff, no, you can't say anything, just leave them alone. 
So my staff was not very happy because at the end, the real estate agent and broker makes money and closing, he got them to closing, but their mortgage payment was 65% of their income. My staff comes to me and says, at 65% of their income, because our data system collects all of the financial and other information, says they're gonna lose the house. And I'm over there, yeah, they're gonna lose the house. And I felt really bad, but then the lesson started. So somewhere along the line, Javier and Maria are not stupid. They figured out this guy was a scam artist. It wasn't Madoff, but he was a scam artist. And so they then got a, uh, uh, what, a refinance clause put in the contract. They then had all the friends that they had borrowed money from descend on the house, repaint it, retiled it, re-landscaped it, got the valuation up, had a refinance that I sat in on, got their payments down to 40%, and at 40% with the rest of these families surrounding them, there's no way they were going to lose that house. They still own that house. This was in 2001. Okay, so that was the first lesson. My staff could never have actually solved or come up with that kind of solution. The second thing is that our data system gives us feedback as to what people do, and the red line for savings start going up for the other five families in that cohort. So I went to the meeting and asked them, so how come you guys are saving? And they, they, they turned over to Javier Maria and said, well, if they can buy a house, we can buy a house. 18 months later, all the other five families owned homes in the United States that until that role model came up, they did not think it was possible to create an asset in the United States, so they had been sending all their savings back to El Salvador. In that process, 5,000 came from El Salvador in this direction. So that was the second lesson. And then they said, so other families that are not in our cohort but are from the refugee community from the war in El Salvador, they're starting to buy homes. So I said, well, there's really three lessons. Fast forward to about a year and a half ago, I told that story at Stanford. And after telling the story, there was a young man came up to me. He says, so you know, my family's from El Salvador. And my mother heard about your family's buying homes, and so we bought a house, and it's the equity from that house that got me through Stanford. So that piece about the ripple was something that actually had happened generationally. And that, again, my staff could never have created. So those are the things that we should be looking at, is the self-grown role modeling that actually tends to be going on. The one that happened, and, and really what I feel like in order to prove this out, um, I was visiting Liberia, and I'd mentioned it before. So that economy, infrastructure, everything was devastated in the Civil War and with Ebola. And so as we were going through these different places, we were running into groups of families that had formed associations. Uh, one was, were fishermen. There was another association of people making mats that would go into houses or the flooring. And then there was another association that actually was a lumber yard. But when we first got to this lumber yard, it was really pretty big. And as we were actually walking into the dirt floors and off the dirt road, that we start seeing a man carrying a piece of lumber on his shoulder. And then we saw somebody else with a wheelbarrow kind of carrying out sawdust. And then as we walked further in, we saw a red cross over here that might have been their pharmacy. And then on the right-hand side, we saw a man sitting on a pile of lumber, then a woman sitting on a different pile of lumber, saw somebody making doors on this side, people cooking on this side, got to the back. There was a big saw that they said that somebody had connections to the US was able to get that saw so they could cut the trees. And that every, uh, every other Wednesday, that there was somebody in the northern villages where the trees were that would go up in the mountaintop wherever there's cell phone signal and they would tell them how many trees they needed and that person knew the people that could cut the tree <laughs> and then who could truck it up here. This was really elaborate, right? And so then I'm asking him, so who runs this, who owns this business? And they said, nobody. So it turns out that in order to run this thing, it was an association where they cooperatively formed this business, and it was 132 families running this whole thing. Now, that kind of resourcefulness you don't see even among the privileged. So somehow or other, you know, there, these are the things that we need to see. We need to see what my mother's talent was. We need to see what all of these talents are. But we have no mechanism for really recognizing it and for building it. So the piece that I want to leave you with is that I think things are changing. So I started that project, the Family Independence Initiative, to show that the, the capacity was actually there in the neighborhoods 15, 16, 17 years ago. Now, I think things are changing. I mean, there has to be some frustration that after more than 50 years of the war on poverty, we have not closed the, the wealth and income gap. And so we have to look at something's fundamentally wrong. And so what's the biggest untapped asset? 
And the biggest untapped asset are really the people themselves. We've got three quarters of the population, almost six billion people living in and around poverty. And we don't know their talents. We don't have a me mechanism to invest in them. So big experiment is gonna be happening. A coalition is being put together and we are gonna change an economy, a full economy from the ground up. We're gonna invest in those lumber yards, we're gonna invest in that mat making things in the fishermen, all of these associations. So the investments are gonna be anywhere from $200 to 5,000 in the first tier. And we'll have actually different tiers of funding as these businesses grow. And what we're gonna do is run the economics to watch, in particular Liberia is probably the biggest uh, target for us, we will be able to see a movement of how you can grow an economy from the ground up and prove that actually it's the people themselves have the best ideas and that we don't have to just give tax breaks to the rich or to the corporations, that actually what we need is to invest on the ground and actually have the tiers of funding so that they actually can move up and break past a lot of these barriers that we have artificially created. So that's a big opportunity. I, um, I will be signing books around noon wherever the book thing is, and I would love any advice and any uh, discussion that people want to have around that. So thank you, and let's change it. <laughs>